Hi, my name is Manuela Zamora. I'm New York Sanders Executive Director. New York Sanders is a not-for-profit organization that brings hydroponic farming technology into the public school classroom. We work uh, with the schools from kindergarten to 12th grade, and what we do is changing the way schools will teach and learn science. So we work with the principal and the team of teachers that are uh, at that specific school uh, to design the space first. So we bring 21st century commercial-based technology for hydroponic farming and aquaponics in some cases to design this, the learning space. After we, we design the space and we agree on what are the priorities for the school and for the teacher, we install the system, the several systems that we put, and then we train the teacher in how to use the technology, but also provide comprehensive, grade specific year-round curriculum. So the program becomes an integrated part of the curricula. This is meant to be taught during the school time, even though it's possible that some schools may want to use it as an after school or, so, or, as, or as a summer program. So how this relates to urban farming and, and uh, sustainability. We're creating this new science lab, but it's really an urban farm. The idea is that by bringing this technology into the classroom, students will learn from seed to harvest all the science connections that can fit through that process. And uh, we make it relevant because those science concepts are standard-based. So the teacher will be teaching what is supposed to be taught at that grade while the students are farming in the classroom. That means that it's a hands-on, a project-based uh, approach to learning. It is a um, different way of learning science by experimentation, by practice. There's collaboration, but there's also uh, aspects of critical thinking, skills, as well as um, other aspects related to community building, etc. So that just comes um, embedded within the practices that um, happen in the classroom. I'll guide you through the students' experience within the classroom. So they will be able to choose among hundreds of different types of seeds because literally there are hundreds of types of seeds that you can use in this technology. Several types of uh, lettuces, basil, chard, all sorts of leafy greens in some of the systems. And then you have the vine crop system for vines, where you can have tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, pumpkins, as well as flowers, edible flowers. For those, students will uh, be able to see not only how the seed germinates and how the plants grow, but also the importance of pollination and how a flower becomes a fruit and, that, and follow that process, which is magical, really, to be able to see in the classroom. So every aspect of this uh, process will be deconstructed and connected into a science concept and that uh, really usually fits into the standards that are mandated by the state. But if they are not mandated, of course they are part of the learning process and that's uh, what goes uh, beyond of the traditional expectation that, uh, that a regular science curriculum would bring. What, why is this uh, interesting or more interesting than a traditional science curriculum is really, as we said before, the hands-on and the project-based approach to learning while you're growing food, but also that extension, that additional connection to real life. And that is what we call the sustainability extension. And that's what defines our curriculum as a sustainability science curriculum. And that's very important for the moment we're living. We need to bring this uh, different way of learning and different way of understanding or connecting what we learn into our, into our everyday life because of climate change and all the um, needs uh, for us to live a more sustainably and build in a more sustainable plan. Hi, my name is Joellen Schulman, and I'd like to invite you into my classroom at PS199. So we have this amazing classroom conversion by New York Sunworks. And over here, I have my classroom side where we do our required science curriculums. While you're here, I'll give you a little sneak peek. Part of our work, we work on sustainability, and some of my students will be presenting at a youth leadership conference. And let me just show you a few of their slides. And so they're talking about how our classroom inspired 
um, their work in sustainability. And then these are some of the signs that my leadership group puts around the building. And they apply it to real life, which is really the highest form of thinking you can do. Now let's continue to my favorite part of my classroom, our greenhouse with our hydroponic systems. Over here we have some traditional systems. Um, this is called an NFT, nutrient film technique. So this uses about 80% less water than traditional farming methods. Over here, this is called a tower garden. We have a lot of herbs. We've got sage and oregano. This is kale, thyme, rosemary, dill. And not only do we grow these, my kids eat them. They also cook with them. These are radishes which traditionally would grow round underground. And instead, in our system, the kids can see how they adapt to growing indoors. And adaptation is a big thing. As climate change becomes more and more a part of the problem, it's the plant's ability and our ability to adapt to continue to make sure we have secure food systems. This is my most favorite system in the lab. This is our vine crop system, and so these are flowering and fruiting plants. Throughout all the systems, I allow my students to do experiments. A lot of them are tied to sustainability, where maybe they play with the levels of acidity in the water, mimicking what's happening to our oceans. They sometimes use our seeding stations, where they've worked with pollution, what happens if pollution gets into plants. And of course, there's tons of science tie-ins, from here, they can pick fruits and we can do seed to seed experiments. We can look at pollination. We can look at what happens when things don't pollinate. On top of that, they make connections to things like when we're studying electricity and energy transfer. What better thing to look at than plants and how light energy is transferred into food energy? While hydroponics isn't the answer to all of our problems with food insecurity and sustainability during climate change, it is one of the solutions. So my students really look to see what you can grow and what you can't grow within a hydroponic system. They also feel really connected to their community. I had one class ask if they could grow lettuce to donate to a homeless shelter. So we used this entire system to grow heads of lettuce, which we then donated to our community. When you're looking for the best place to implement solutions, in the hopes of abating climate change and reversing the tide, schools are where it counts. These are the future scientists, engineers, problem solvers, and they've got solutions that we haven't even started. So here in elementary school, I capture them young, I get them excited, I get them connected to their planet and to each other, and from there, we've got curiosity, ingenuity, and a desire to make our world a better place. So in addition to growing from seed to harvest, we have other factors that are connected to, to, the, to the farming requirements and to the space. One very important is integrated pest management. So every classroom has an IPM station, which includes uh, beneficial insects that will be really taking care of the pests that we have. Because we're in an urban environment and because these are not um, commercial farms, they are classroom, and we have in some cases, 150 students in and out every day. We have many pests that comes in people's clothing or shoes or even food that they may bring in, into the space. We welcome those pests because they offer an opportunity for learning. Students will use the beneficial insects to fight the pests that are in, in our plants. So many times our uh, aphids are the most popular pests and we use ladybugs that will be eating the aphids. So a perfect example is a first grade curriculum. Students are required to learn about insects. So first graders will, do, will learn insects with the aphids and the ladybugs as their case study. It's their, they are in the classroom, they can see them, they can observe them, they can learn not only about parts of their bodies or reproduction, etc. But then they go into this additional connection, which is why are they important? So ladybugs are beneficial to us because they're going to eat the pests that otherwise are going to eat our food, or we would have to get rid of them in some other way. And then they will understand the difference between using beneficial insects rather than pesticides. 
uh, and then you know goes deeper into what happens with pesticides. Why are they not recommended? And then it's it, the connection happens immediately in terms of okay, if I put pesticides in this um, lettuces, uh, then I'm going to eat the pesticide when I eat the lettuce. But that's an example of how the classroom practices really connect to the everyday life of the student and also to the sustainability concepts that, as I said before, is so fundamental to bring into the classroom today. So here we've got the ladybugs. They help us eat the aphids. And this is a strawberry plant. And a fun fact about ladybugs is that they can hibernate for a couple months in your fridge. So if you've got spare ladybugs, just stick them in your fridge and they will just be sleeping. And when we release the ladybugs, they like to fly around and, you know, make everything their home. And students really have a fun time with it. They love the ladybugs. Sometimes they're scared of the ladybugs, but they add a really wonderful component to the classroom. At the same time, we have um, a worm composting in every uh, single classroom. That's part of the setting we bring. That means that uh, all the food scraps from the farming practices are uh, put in the worm composting bin for decomposition and then we have compost out of that practice. So this is where we have worm compost. We take any cuttings from our labs, any plants, even anything that the students ate, they can bring them into the worm bin. And here the worms eat the food and they divert it into nutrient dense soil. So this really teaches us that waste has a lot of potential and it teaches us the sustainability of the cycles of life and waste becomes new life. The worms bring so many new opportunities for learning, and that's a great way to reach the middle school kids, particularly in the United States, because the schools are divided in three groups, K through five, six through eight, or nine to 12. The middle school years are only three years. One year they arrive, sixth grade they adapt, seventh grade really focus, and in New York City they focus on getting ready for eighth grade, which is the year that is the high school application process. So it goes really, really fast, uh, I feel that there's difficult uh, engagement because of that short period of time. Now when it's like in a transition time and also uh, the kids are in a tough age. They are growing, they are not kids anymore, they're becoming older. So all, everything happens, so many things happen in middle school, you know, that it's really harder to teach those ages, but it's also very magical. And therefore using these opportunities and engaging moments within this classroom is, is very magical. We also believe that middle school is a time you may lose many of the kids' interest in science, and it's a key moment to keep them engaged so they continue into science when they go to high school. So that includes girls, that includes um, minority groups, uh, second uh, English as a second language uh, students, and of course, any other one who would like to be engaged in science and, and, and therefore here's an opportunity to do so. In New York City Public Schools, it's required starting in seventh grade that you have certified or and dedicated science teacher. So for us as partners, when we go to school, we work with a specialized science teacher starting in seventh grade and uh, providing the teacher all these opportunities to fulfill the curriculum and the standards that are supposed to be taught uh, we have uh, the, the feedback from teachers that say, I love this curriculum, not only because I see my students absolutely engaged, but I'm also engaged and I'm also reinvigorated and I love teaching with these tools. It's bringing me, you know, joy and new ways of reaching uh, the, the community and, well, in particular, their own students. Well, a New York typical classroom uh, will have the traditional uh, learning space with tables, group tables and, and chairs. Usually we recommend that. And then it will have, uh, it will be surrounded by the technology that we bring. So we'll have a couple of tower systems. We have different types of towers, uh, uh, tower technology. It will have what is called uh, one or two, depending on the space, NFTs, nutrient field technique system for the leafy greens. It's going to have one vine crop system, which is depending on different sizes for vine crops. It's also called the Dutch bucket system. So different number of buckets depending on the space, but the system will be the same. It will also have a seedling station, a worm composting bin, an IPM station, 
we also provide a lot of teaching tools that will be displayed in the classroom as the year progresses. So we have word wall cards and we have instructions for classroom behavior. We have a crop calendar and to name some. All our curriculum is available, accessible online, so the teachers can project images from the curriculum they have. There's videos of students explaining projects uh, or other teachers explaining projects because the fact that we are in more than 200 schools in the five boroughs allow us to have this large community, which is really a big resource uh, for all of us um, to tap in. There are teachers who are excellent teaching K through eighth or second grade or fourth grade or, or other teachers who are really focused uh, or experts obviously in high school and they have tips for other high school teachers. So we create this connection among the partners of New York Sandworks and we use that as an important resource so the teachers can use what others, what works for others in other schools or similar communities. High school is another exciting group of grades that we offer everything that I mentioned. Same technology, same setup of classroom, but different curriculum and different engagement for the students. Uh, high school is when it gets more specific and uh, dives uh, deeper into uh, specific concepts. Still, you have the seed to harvest and the farming process that every student needs to go through. Therefore, it offers opportunities for all types of learners. Some students may just focus on the farming and then go very um, deep into those different ways of uh, improving plant growth and they can become real experts on them. And other students may want to focus more on concepts of photosynthesis and how the process happens and how to explain in different ways to other students or go into deeper research on other aspects more connected to chem chemistry or physics, etc. It really opens a door for students to go into deep research um, while they are still having fun and growing plants and working as a community. One aspect that is really fun about the classrooms is that it really creates a community. You need everyone working together to be able to maintain uh, the farm uh, progressing and the plants growing. So we need people to take care of the seeds and to take care of the plants and to take care of the pH level and electricity levels and temperature, etc. So there's space for so many different uh, ways of getting engaged and so many different ways to, to reach the student where the student is. The point is that it, the reality is that every classroom has different types of learners, different levels of knowledge and different interests from the students. So providing this variety of requirements um, and, and providing this variety of needs that a farm has, it really allows the teacher to offer each student different options for them to get engaged to and then dig deeper into that specific knowledge. That's been very successful because we have uh, solved the problem to the teacher on, on how to teach at different levels. The content may be a little bit different or what they are, the students are focusing may be different, but the points of the checking points and the assessments are the same. So in that way, we, the teacher can manage this differentiation while they are really uh, working on a seed to harvest process and learning the science content that is um, expected to be learned during that class. So some of the school, uh, schools we go and work with are 90% uh, English language learners. Let's say a school can be really mostly uh, Hispanic families and many may be um, a new generation of immigrants or just immigrated to the country and they are really just learning English. The classroom space we offer, um, or we create in the school, it really offers uh, a safe space for many of the kids. That's, that's what we hear from the teachers and from the communities. They say, well, the, the new students love to come because they feel that is a space they can come anytime, let's say during recess or during lunchtime. When, when they can move freely through the, uh, throughout the school, they choose to go to the classroom because there is a, something to do for them. They are busy. It's a connection. And there is a small community there. They talk with other kids that are 
maybe in similar situations, or maybe they feel they have a one-on-one -on -one time with the teacher who's there. So that's very beautiful to see uh, how the classroom not only um, addresses the primary goal we had, which is bringing sustainability science education to the schools, uh, but also uh, it's reaching other aspects like uh, social emotional learning, uh, equity and inclusion. So that's something that we have anecdotes from teachers that tell us that that's uh, something they see. And we hear from many, many different uh, schools. A very important aspect that, that we're doing in the schools is the connection to sustainability and climate education. So we started bringing sustainability science because we're doing the science that is mandated and the connection to sustainability. And what's the human the human aspect that connects these two concepts. So that's what we do. But from the very beginning, we believe that that concept, that, un that understanding of science and sustainability, that connection that we make as humans and what's our role in it, it's fundamental to understand climate education and to understand what is climate change and what is the, the reality of our planet in regards to climate uh, issues that we're facing. We're very proud to say that we are all about sustainability science and climate education. Through the years, we've seen the program and the lessons have working really, really well. The teachers embrace them, they use the lessons, that we see the result we want to see in the students. But we had uh, a, a really wonderful problem, <laughs> which is that we grow hundreds of pounds of vegetables per year in every single classroom. So that's something really great, of course, and that's something to celebrate. And it required the development of a specific program. What do we do with the food, which is so important. So we created the Harvest Program to ensure that we're providing the tools to the teachers and those communities to make the best out of the food that is grown in the community. First of all, it's certified that is good quality and that, um, that anyone can eat it because we use good quality water, the water in the schools is tested, etc. So that food is certified that, that can be consumed by, by the community. And second, we created this program to provide um, lessons and to the teachers so they can divide it among the students equally. It may seem simple, but when you're in a school and you're worrying about being equitable and being make, making sure that every student gets something or part of it, it may be a barrier for some teachers to actually harvest and give the food to the community. Hello, my name is Sheldon. Right now I'm harvesting some broccoli leaves and really most people think that broccoli only could be eaten for the head, but right here we have broccoli actually starting to go to seed. So we're actually just harvesting the leaves to eat and a way to prepare the broccoli leaves is actually sauteing them. Um, you could um, boil them, steam them, and you know, you could add your favorite herbs and spices to them to make them delicious. So a way that my family prepares them is we actually add spices and onions and garlic and we saute them to eat them. So, you know, it's really delicious. So with the harvest program, we provide the tools to the teachers so they can actually do it in a consistent way. And that includes a connection to our harvest calendar, who's harvesting when, who's taking the food when, et cetera, et cetera. So we've so created um, several tools that allow the, that encourages the families to have conversations with the students as they bring food home. What's happening in the classroom? What is hydroponics? Uh, what is basil or what is uh, misuna? You know, all these uh, shrimp, leafy greens that are taken home, but it may be that the families are looking at them or tasting them for the first time. It happens to all of us. There's always a surprise of what leafy green is this one that I didn't know about. Uh, what's the flavor? Did you like it or not? Did your family like it or not? Or if your family knew about this leafy green before, uh, how they knew about it. Maybe it's something from your culture. We have so many cultures here in New York and, and maybe you use basil in one way and I use basil in a different way. Or, or maybe... Um, it's something that is uh, very uh, connected to your uh, ancestors, how they used to use this uh, leaf and, and in your home country, how, how 
they you will love use you would use it now. So it's really a connector. Food is always a connector. But the whole point of the harvest program is not only to distribute it equally, so the students bring that piece uh, of um, basically fruit of their labor <laughs> home, uh, which make them very proud. It's something they've grown at home. It's like bringing, bringing art work from the classroom. It's bringing a piece of your work. But they also bring the science concepts they've learned in the, they are learning in the classroom and uh, encourage them to have conversations so they are proud of their heritage, their community, that then they will bring back into the classroom and have a conversation with the teacher and share with other students. So all that is part of the Harvest program, uh, which uh, is um, bringing so much more to the communities we work with. So how we support the teachers? Uh, we provide training on technical training on how to use the technology, just fairly simple, but it requires time and focus and practice. And then the most important one is we provide access to the comprehensive curriculum. It's all online, so they can sign in through their account and access to all the lessons, teaching materials, tools, videos, everything that is available. And most importantly, we provide teacher training, professional learning opportunities for the teachers on how to implement that curriculum within this classroom. Usually the lesson itself is never a problem. The teachers know how to, how to teach that, how to use them. What we discuss a lot is the classroom management, how to work in small groups, how to bring the hands-on into a large group of students, uh, how to deal with the excitement because the students love to, to be in the classroom and be doing things. So how, how to manage classroom management really in such an exciting setting and with uh, so many changing factors as the students learn. So that's a skill and that requires a, a, a learning curve, but really the results are um, wonderful and, and excite the teachers because they see how engaged the students are, how much they learn and um, how much the teachers themselves uh, learn in the process. So there is a lot of activity and, uh, and good energy happening in, within the school and connects this entire school community. And each school is like a family and a different world. But how do we connect all these schools is something that is also uh, interesting for us. And the way we do it is through our annual youth conference. It's called New York San Works Discovering Sustainability Science Conference. And uh, that's where we have a presentation from our school partners and where students will have three or four minutes to explain a project they are working on within that classroom. It could be the worm composting, it could be the IPM, it can be building their own systems, uh, focusing on new technology, testing new technology, focusing on uh, uh, reproduction, uh, what, you name it. So we have the annual conference. We've been doing it for about 10 years, I think, every May. And we have uh, that wonderful representation uh, where the students not only share their content, but learn from other students as they participate. The conference is streaming live, and uh, therefore everyone uh, that is there in person can can attend, about, uh, you know, 700 uh, students usually. Uh, but uh, since COVID, uh, it's uh, even more common that we also have a virtual version of the conference. My name is Kiana Miki, and I'm the executive director of the Mayor's Office for Urban Agriculture. So it's the city's first office focused on urban agriculture and finding ways to minimize climate crisis, as well as increasing the access to and the production of uh, locally fresh food. I'm here today at the, on the rooftop of the Javits Convention Center, their rooftop farm, to learn from farmer scientists and students in the New York Sunworks program to hear about the projects that they're doing in the classroom, uh, the lessons that they're learning. And also for me, it's an opportunity to hear from our emerging climate stewards on what they see is a viable and sustainable future for New York City. That's all a part of urban agriculture. Mayor Adams has a priority to addressing climate change, increasing healthy food access, um, and a plant-rich diet for all New Yorkers, but also the opportunity for us to grow our food here in New York City. 
And what better than to support and cultivate um, growers right now? New York Sun Works has done a great work teaching hundreds of New York City students in their classrooms around ag education, the life cycle of plants, and also how do we address climate crisis. If we're going to have a sustainable future, we need to work on that now, and I'm so glad to see the students here. While working with high school students and working in underserved communities of New York, because that's where our majority of our projects are, uh, we realize that many of the students we work with are not necessarily choosing to go to college. Uh, they may choose to go to community college or may not choose to continue education but go directly to the workforce. Because of the particular interest in our classroom and our program, we've, we realize that we have a group of students that could really benefit from a hydroponic farming certification program. We created that certification and we piloted that uh, this past summer in partnership with the Summer Youth Employment Program from the Mayor's Office. So we created a 160 hours program, I think, of seed to harvest hydroponic specialty uh, for entry level farmer. The students uh, not only went through our curriculum, uh, but in addition, they were paid by the summer program of New York City. Uh, so they, they, it was a wonderful um, example of a partnership with other institutions. This uh, certification will be offered in our partner schools throughout the year. So we're working on having that part of the regular curriculum or as part of a, an after school program. The whole point of the certification program is to reach a group of students and show them that there is this whole new market, open market of jobs, of new green jobs they can be part of. There's an enormous investment in um, urban farming and particularly in um, hydroponic farming, vertical farming. Uh, that is they, they, that requires a workforce and that's in development currently and there is a need of people to be in, um, working uh, and uh, there is a need of a training for, to fulfill those jobs. These are new careers. This is something that it didn't exist before and it may not be in the minds of many people, neither the adults who are teaching those students or the, the, the students themselves. So with the certification, we tested that many students were not interested really in farming, but after the program, they were fascinated with the possibilities. They, some really loved uh, the, the opportunity to be a farmer, but also uh, they realized that there's so many careers related to farming from technology, artificial intelligence, coding, you know, there's just so much that is connected that uh, it's not really about the product or, or the, the food itself. The majority were interested in the actual farming process, which is wonderful, but it really opened everyone's eyes that there's this enormous space and um, job opportunities that didn't exist before. New York City is very particular in how uh, the Department of Education works. What is very interesting and allows programs like ours to be in schools is really the independence that the schools have, not only in terms of their budget, but also in how they teach the standards. Our program is, is really for schools who are open to have this project-based and hands-on approach to education. It really fits that type of teaching. Um, and we do want to make sure and we want to be accountable in terms of uh, content learning that is, of course, necessary, but also bring in these other concepts that are very new and not yet mandatory in any curriculum, climate education and sustainability science. So if we can teach what is supposed to be taught and bring these other concepts, then we're in a, it's, a, it's a win for everyone. And the schools see that. So the schools, some schools are immediately attracted to our program because they see the benefits of this philosophical approach to, approach to teaching and learning. So that's very particular to New York because some schools can choose, I want to work with this not-for-profit or this organization or this um, program, and therefore they can create these partnerships that are uh, changing and bringing different ways of learning into their communities.
From there, the Department of Education sees what's working in schools and observes uh, what our uh, practices of schools have so they can recommend other schools to go in one direction or another. We go to school to enhance what they already have and to not change but to add uh, and provide new, uh, new tools for the teachers to teach and, and new opportunities for the students to learn. We had conversations with the chancellor or uh, other Department of Education representatives who visit our schools and see the success of the program. And they recognize it. They say, oh, we love to see how engaged students are. We love to see the, the examples of work the teachers have in, in the classroom. And then we love to see the success that the program is going. So there is uh, support for the program. Uh, and that, I think, is very particular to New York because, again, you can enter the school because it's a school chose to work or teach in one way or another. Well, it's really exciting to see so much interest on our program within the communities. Such a variety, such a diversity of schools and such an enormous diversity within those school communities is really great. Not only in terms of uh, languages and cultures and ways to see the world, uh, also, um, we have the ability to grow so much food that brings the entire community together. Hi, my name is Hannah O'Leary. I am the urban agriculture teacher here at Rachel Carson High School in Coney Island, which is in South Brooklyn. I'm a part of a growing number of educators in New York City and in Brooklyn South who are exploring the agriculture space and helping to bring these learning opportunities to students here in New York City. We don't have a lot of space outside here in New York City, so instead of using soil for farming, we use these hydroponic systems, which help us to save space, water, and energy when we're growing our plants. So this class gives my students an opportunity to learn about the sustainability issues related to growing food in the United States and abroad some of the social justice issues related to climate change and how climate change affects our food supply. And for the students who are working in our CEA certification program, it teaches them how to grow food in an industrial setting, how the plants look from seed all the way up to harvest, and gives them an idea of how to safely handle, prepare, and sell the produce that they're able to grow. In the long run, how many schools in New York City would you like to collaborate with with the program? Yes. I want every single school in New York City to have a learning lab, a hydroponic farm, a hydroponic classroom in place so students can learn sustainability science and climate education during the school time. So when they go into the world, their adult life, when they go to college or to work, they already know what they need to know and make um, educated decisions in terms of what's uh, their impact in their communities and their impact on the environment. What is your interpretation of environmental education? The way we bring environmental education to our program is really through a concept that we call sustainability science. And for us, that's a triangle. It's the connection between humans, technology, and the environment and how those three elements combined together can bring positive outcomes for a sustainable living, a sustainable future. What's our impact as humans? What, what can we do as humans in using technology to improve the environment? Uh, since you mentioned sustainability, what are maybe the key elements of that sustainable future that we are trying to build? Mm -hmm. Maybe specifically in New York City, but maybe in general as well. Yeah, I think the, uh, you know, the general concept of taking care of uh, our natural resources uh, in a way that they are not depleted and they last through generations. Uh, so that's in, you know, general concept of sustainability. So the understanding that we as humans are part of those decisions and that our actions have an impact on, on that chain, um, it really uh, brings the concept of sustainability into any human who's learning about it. So again, our focus from kindergarten to 12th grade during school years, um, going deeper into understanding how that triangle can actually 
uh, coexist and it should coexist uh, because of all the challenges we're living in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Overpopulation, on the other hand, really good development of technology and also uh, this concept of sustainability. So how do we put it, these pieces of the puzzle together for a positive outcome for humans? And we are clear that the positive outcome is really to take care of nature and have an environment that supports uh, the living of us, uh, all, all um, humans, but also all living things, plants and animals, all of us. Since you just mentioned the technological fix for environmental or sustainability issues, what is your thinking about equal distribution of technology? Because we are in one of the most advanced city, but even within the city, we don't see that all communities have equal access to technology that can Correct. reduce our impact on the environment or achieve mm -hmm. other aspects of sustainability. Well, I think that based on my experience, I'm from Bolivia. I grew up in, in Bolivia uh, and uh, South America, and it's an emerging economy, as we say today. And uh, we always see the developed world as the example and the path to follow. There's always this big uh, divide on accessing technology and accessing, it used to be accessing information. Now with uh, internet, it's much easier, obviously. And, and, and still we see um, after the pandemic, precisely, we see the differences in access of Wi-Fi or other elements that would allow uh, an equal access to technology in general, in the general term. Having said that, I grew up always thinking creatively, like all of us in the south part of the globe, how do best use what you have access to? Uh, and I think uh, the access of technology should be thought in terms of uh, what is that you really need to have access to, at least to get to get started with uh, a first exposure and a first use of technology. So in our case, um, uh, Wi-Fi, for example, could be very, very important and we've seen for to access for developing businesses, for education, for so many aspects. So that's there and that's a reality. But at the same time, there are other type of technology that is not the traditional technology that we may think. So we bring hydroponic farming technology, uh, which is something that can be in, uh, implemented without the use of, for example, large amount of electricity or even electricity. You could use solar panels because it's very little electricity that you need to, to, to move the water around. Or when you don't have access to water, in, in where water is not really easy accessible, for example or you don't have Wi-Fi or computers. So it is a different way of bringing technology into the communities and that's what we're doing. So it does not fix in the access of technology, but I think if we address the need of technology based on the immediate needs of the communities, it will be easier to achieve more equality. What keeps you going? Different things. I, I visit schools and there's nothing like going to the classroom and seeing the kids so excited about what they are doing. It's just that energy that it makes you feel like this is awesome. This is why we do everything we do. And it can be just one kid. It doesn't have to be the entire school. It doesn't have to be everyone. It can be just one kid who is just so proud of what they do. And I'll tell you a story. We went to a um, to ribbon cutting and there were, you know, all these things happening while, while the parents were coming and teachers, etc. And we finish with an event and there's this kid who's talking to his mother and he's showing her the, the peppers in the vine crop system. And they are, were gorgeous and, and papers here and tomatoes here. And he was explaining to the mothers. He was so passionate and the mother was listening. They were uh, Latino, so he was speaking in Spanish, I could understand everything. And he was so passionate about explaining. So the teacher had um, agreed that the kids were going to harvest and they could take the, the food home, which is part of our program. So the, he was harvesting and they had a couple of tomatoes and a pepper and he gave it to his mother and, and then she holds it in a little bag and she said, okay, oh, now I need to go home because I need to do stuff, you know, so we we'll, we'll finish our event, the mother says to the kid. And then he, he holds the bag and says, okay, but you can't touch our tomatoes. Um, because she said, I need to go home and I need to cook for all of us. And he said, well, you can't cook with these tomatoes. You need to wait for me. 
once I get to school, we're gonna do this together. You can't touch it. And it was just so amazing how passionate he was about it and how much he was looking forward to the activity with his mother. It just, you know, it touched my heart, made me cry. And, and the mother said, of course, I'm gonna wait for you. It was just so beautiful. And um, I told them that I understood the story and we chatted in Spanish for a little. It was really amazing. So there's just so many stories like that that are important. That was an emotional one. Uh, but I can tell you so many stories about the kids who, who are interested in science because of the program. Kids who see a different future for themselves because of the program. And very honest kids who come and say, listen, I came here and I thought this is going to be terrible and I'm stuck here for a semester. But after a few weeks of working with the systems, it's just amazing and I want to do more in technology and I want to design my, the systems on my, myself and develop these ideas. And these are kids in communities that don't have too many opportunities. So it's not that they were already exposed to this technology or they knew about it before or they know there is a big market out there because there's an enormous investment in, in new hydroponic farms. It's really comes from their heart and from their passion and what, from what they've learned in the classroom. And so the access to, to the technology and to see that it can be very simple and it can uh, um, bring so much into the community. It can be a business in terms of uh, designing the systems themselves. It could be a, a, a business in terms of growing food and selling the food, but also they see other opportunities like uh, Oh, we could distribute this to restaurants. How about the packaging and how about different flavors that we put together? They, they discover all that and they see a, a future for them in this field. That's for the older kids. The younger kids, just the joy of doing science and the magic of plants growing and changing. It, it, it changes very quickly because that's the purpose of controlling environment agriculture. We're, you're, we're maximizing all the needs of the plant, therefore the growth is also maximized. So every time the kid go to the classroom, there is a difference. They've grown half an inch, an inch, depending on how, how much time it's in between visits. But it's, it's really something that it brings a lot of activity and critical thinking and you know, desire to be part of what's going on in the classroom. We are in New York City, which is sort of reinventing itself in terms of its environment and sustainability. I wonder how does New York Sun Works contribute to this larger reimagination, rebuilding, rethinking of this wonderful city? It's very exciting to be part of a city that is constantly reinventing itself. And, and it's just because of the influx of people and different minds and different precisely cultures and you know approaches to everything so creative and uh, as well as competitive and all that happens in New York City. And it's happening also in the area of education and urban farming currently, which is part of what we do. So what we bring is a different way of learning science, a new way of learning uh, not only the traditional science, but also these concepts that are required in the current century, sustainability, and climate education. We cannot allow our students not to know about what's sustainability, what's climate change, until they get to college. So it is our responsibility to start teaching in kindergarten. And we started 10 years ago to doing so. So I think being part of that big picture movement, it is very exciting. We, we bring this very specific part but that connects into understanding other concepts that are very complex. Uh, carbon reduction, uh, our goals by 2030, where we want to be, be by 2050, become a carbon neutral city. We're building the generation that will understand those concepts and should be part of their daily language and their daily goals. So that's how we are part of this new city. Now that uh, New York City is very serious about decreasing its impact on the environment, what is the role of uh, New York Sun Works in this process? From the very beginning, uh, we were uh, focusing on 
understanding the importance of local food production. From day one, we bring into the classroom explanations and connection on to why are we doing this? And that's very important. Why are we thinking differently? Why have we set up this type of classroom? Why do we have this technology and we're learning these uh, new uh, ways of growing food within your community? Uh, and that's absolutely connected with the needs of societies. And today, uh, in terms of reducing gas emissions, for example, uh, which are critical for um, our planet today. Have you seen any examples when schools would start with hydroponics classrooms and uh, go further and expand into other areas of sustainability? Yes, absolutely. So um, usually our schools start with the, our labs and our program. And just the fact that they uh, first, of course, use science and sustainability intro of, to the community, uh, but then they expand into talking about climate change. That alone is an enormous uh, win because then we're discussing everyday issues that will impact our community if it didn't impact already to many of those communities, not only locally, but also back in their own countries. And also, uh, what are possibilities and what are um, opportunities for us to be part as change makers within that reality. So that is a big change that we see happening in all the schools we work with. We are currently working in an assessment to make sure that we can measure what's the impact that, that this program has in their communities. Uh, either parts of the community bring in their knowledge or their experiences into the school or are other programs coming into the school because of this conversation that's happening already. How was New York Sun Works established? Who were the people involved? Uh, what was your role? So New York Sun Works was founded in 2004 by Ted Kaplan. He was a um, PhD student at Columbia University who was uh, proposing uh, a project uh, and created the Science Barge which was a prototype of an urban farm off-grid built under a greenhouse structure on a barge and was sitting on the Hudson River. We had solar power and wind power to show the city of New York that you could grow food, fresh vegetables and fruits in an urban site like New York, but also doing without using traditional energy, but using renewable energy. So as a parent in New York City, I have my children in public schools and I was constantly looking for uh, ways to bring sustainability education into the school because I always believe it was our responsibility as parents but also as educators, that's my background, that we needed to prepare the students and talk the students about climate education and climate change. So there, we, there had to be a way to bring this into education at the moment. I was looking for different things and how we could make that happen. In parallel, one day I was at PTA at my children's school and uh, the science barge came across to our meeting. I was so interested about it and this is very funny in a way. We were 14 people there in the meeting and uh, 13 people said, no way, we don't want to move greenhouse to grow pots and plants and things. And I thought, but this is so different. I'll take over this, I'll do my research, I'll be back. So I contacted the science barge, uh, Dan Ashrak at the moment, who was the person who had sent this information to the school because he had a direct connection. And I said, hey, Dan, how about I talked to the founders of the Science Barge because he was a board member and uh, this Ted Kaplow and his uh, friends. Actually, Viraj Puri was another member who now runs one of the largest hydroponic farms in the United States. So I said uh, this um, person, how about you introduce me to the founders of the Science Barge, uh, Ted, and uh, I will explain the plans I have for this wonderful technology. So I asked Dan, I say, how if I take the technology they are presenting here and use it, creating a curriculum so we can bring it into the classroom? Uh, he was fascinated by, by it. And uh, of course, Ted, as the founder of the Science Barge, had also the idea to use this for education because, you know, it was not only to bring new ways of farming in the city, but also educating the population of New York. So I remember wrote a proposal, 
uh, sent an email here and there, and then there we were co having conversations about building the first science barge lab, the version, the first version of it that will become the rooftop greenhouse at the Manhattan School for Children that today is called the Sanor Center. One thing led to another. We grew with, of course, many parents from the community, so much support. We grew a larger team at New York Sunworks and brought this into today, more than 230 schools in the five boroughs. I would like to learn a little bit more about the evolution of New York Sunworks. In the past, I've heard a little bit more often that this program is science education or maybe STEM education. And now a little bit more often I hear such words as sustainability education and climate education. The progression is very exciting because when we started, we wanted to have uh, hydroponics and aquaponics as a hands-on and project-based approach to the concepts we wanted to teach. So that remained the same. The way we communicated the concepts we were learning did progress because we were all about climate change from the very beginning, climate education. But in 2010, it was not accepted uh, commonly to talk about climate change. It was too political. So we realized suddenly that the doors were closing to this wonderful opportunity because people was not very sure, mm, do I want to bring that to my school? It's going to be controversial. I don't know. And it was really understanding the science behind it, which is all about sustainability and when you understand what work what doesn't work and what's our role as humans in this big picture then you understand the climate concepts why things are happening so we stopped calling it climate education we just focus on sustainability science it took 10 years to be able to talk about climate education and what is the core of the content that is provided in the schools so really, the idea can, remains the same because we're using science and this specific technology to understand what's our role as humans in the environment, how our attitudes and behaviors can make a change, how we are part of this big problem, but we're also the solution to this big problem. Often, urban agriculture education programs suggest that they prepare future workforce for agriculture. And uh, we know that less than 2% of the population in the U.S. are involved in farming. You know, will not require that many people to know how to farm. Can you comment a little bit on this? When we work with the schools, we're not necessarily only thinking on the workforce development. I think by understanding, again, uh, sustainability science, climate education combined with it, it opens your mind, Point, opens the student's mind and thinking out of the box in terms of the solutions to the problems we need to face. So that's the first step. So having people that is really learning about the reality, understanding the science that informs the reality, becoming an informed citizen, and also someone who can read, understand facts and have come up with a conclusion and therefore who would drive an, atti an attitude or a behavior. That alone is very important. It's, it's thinking critically. And that's what happens in the classroom. So regardless if these students will go into farming in particular or will become scientists, uh, that's another option, or any career they will pursue, the skills they are learning as they are part of this program are very important as well-rounded, well-educated, critical thinkers of today and of tomorrow. So that's step one. <laughs> then we hope more of these students will go into science. And there's just such an enormous variety of science careers and, 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 and science related careers that are open now and they are new and there will be more in the future. So that's our second you know, goal. And then we go into older students and especially high school students and there is a percentage of those students that they may, may become farmers but when we talk about our farmer scientists that's how we call our students in the classroom when we talk uh, about what is to be a farming scientist maybe becoming the farmer of the future who's uh, as an urban citizen who lives in a dense environment who 
can have a small size farm, medium size farm, maybe a larger size, depending on the realities and the business they want to build. But it's not only about the food they would produce, it's about so many aspects related to the farming industry. It could be uh, designing artificial intelligence because as you said, it's, there's more and more automatizations to be more productive and more efficient to grow food. Then there is also aspects in terms of uh, quality of plant, flavor, levels of nutrients into the um, systems, etc. So there's a lot of uh, continuous change and evolution within this new industry, as well as uh, so many opportunities into uh, packaging or designing or developing new products to replace plastic that currently is how we package all these greens to go to the supermarkets, and etc. So it's very large and because it is a growing population, there's so many people we need to feed. I think it is a very large area that can offer a job in the future to, to many, more than what we think traditionally. Do you think that more and more population in the city will have maybe their private mini farms and their <laughs> apartments? Hopefully, I, I think so. The more local access to food production, the better. This is what I want to think it will happen. The more we can farm in the cities, all the leafy greens and all the vines and fruits that we can grow would allow us to free land from the agriculture practices so we can have reforestation and recovery of ecosystems and create that balance that we're missing currently. So that's, that's my dream. And at the same time, I do believe it is uh, pretty magical that, that we're going back to cities growing their own foods and communities eating what is uh, produced you know, in their own neighborhoods. I think it's wonderful for all the environmental impacts that that has, but also because of flavor. I mean, food, it can be delicious. It has to be delicious. So that's another aspect that we bring into the classroom. The kids eat the fresh food and it's so full of taste and flavor, it's just delicious. They all love it and that's luxury now and they, that becomes what they want to have and that's what we should all have because there's no reason why it shouldn't be really full of flavor and fresh. Um, so that's another aspect of what, how cities are changing and how can improve the quality of life of all the urban citizens. With food that didn't travel 2,000 miles. Exactly. Uh, you know, not only traveling, but can you imagine it's been frozen or cold, probably not ripened, you know, just so many aspects of it and therefore there's no flavor. So flavor alone, I think it is a reason to <laughs> farm locally and really enjoy. Can you imagine the level of nutrients and the, and the joy that that brings to eating? You mentioned the disconnect that there, used, there is between food production, where food comes from, right? People uh, choosing their food and, and that disconnect of where food comes from. But I think there is another disconnect that was something that I was um, impressed when I came into living in New York City and seeing the families, the school life and the students and the disconnect with the rest of the planet, the existence of other countries, other communities, another planet was not an, an everyday conversation or a reality for the students of New York City. So when we developed this program, that was one of the aspects that I thought it was so important to reach and say, bring through our program the notion, the concept that there is an entire planet it's, uh, they, uh, and there is a entire communities that are impacted by our actions. And that connects to something I mentioned before, growing in Bolivia, we always see the developing world giving the guidelines and you know what's next and what's coming and what should be done or not. So we're used to seeing the entire world, what's going on in other continents and what's going on in, in the specific countries. I, I don't know if it's particular to the United States and to New York City within the United States. The notion that our act, uh, actions have an impact in and the entire planet is, wasn't, is not necessar necessarily there. So when we talk about farming and the fact that you're growing locally and not bringing 
and the impact of gas emissions for transportation or other aspects that are related to, to what we're doing. It brings the notion that there are all these other communities that are working so we can, they can provide food to urban environments like New York. And if we uh, throw, don't, don't do good um, waste management or we waste food, etc., we're impacting all those communities back. And that's something very hard to grasp for students at lower grades and different ages. Besides teaching for, let's say, science standards, what are some of the educational goals of New York City schools? And uh, where does your program help uh, the city to achieve these goals? Well, uh, the, the most important goals for uh, New York City schools are usually literacy goals and math. So the, that's the main focus, and the the standards are high, and the results are you know better or worse in depending different reasons, different locations. Uh, but that's the main focus, and then becomes uh, science. So that's why our push for science because it's not one of the main focus, the most important focus in the K to 12 education. I think uh, it is very important to have the ability to connect different concepts and I think science allows for that. Other subjects will allow the same, let's say arts will allow you to also use different concepts, maybe math and physics, etc. to, to you know, create different combination of concepts to, to, in a creative way. But we focus on science and uh, that's how we bring all these different concepts together. From your conversations with uh, actual teachers and school principals, do they have any like informal goals? Yes, I think uh, currently social emotional learning is very important component of teaching and in many schools is uh, one of the most important parts of the learning curve. So any program that would support the outcomes on the social emotional evolution of a student would be welcome and, and I think that's very important. Because if you don't feel well, what can you learn? I think it's fundamental for, for the development of the student. That's one aspect. Another aspect that I see that educators bring as a priority is maybe more on the philosophical approach of learning. So they really want to not to teach for the test, but to teach for the enjoyment of learning. And therefore taking the time of going more into the quality rather than into the quantity and also using project-based approach or hands-on approach of learning, allowing for different learning entry points for each student depending on their abilities or their interests. I think it's wonderful because, you know, anything you learn, you may forget, but when you learn through experimentation, it really remains with you forever. Problem solving just becomes part of the routine because there's just so many things that can go in different ways. There are many things that can, can go uh, uh, quote unquote wrong, but they are just different ways of, or different results that the students have in the process. So if a plant may not, may not be doing really well, or maybe the seeds didn't germinate because they had too much water or too little water, etc. We learn from the process and we say, well, this is what happened, so next time we're going to do this other way, and that becomes a lesson rather than a failure. I wonder how can a hydroponic classroom be compatible not only with science and sustainability learning, but also with uh, art, history, cultures, and celebration of human nature, identity of each student. Yeah, I love the identity with each student. I'll go with that first because New York City has the wonderful uh, community of people that comes from all over the world. So there's so many languages spoken just in one school, several languages, uh, different cultural backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds religions, beliefs, everything is in one place. It, it really reflects the reality of the city and that's wonderful. And um, working with that uh, pool of people that is, you know, with different ideas and seeing things differently is just, you know, so wonderful. And the classroom brings that together. So something that is very typical is to compare. So how do you eat the same vegetable or same leafy green? 
and and maybe some that you never saw but others are very used to that specific vegetable basil cilantro or bok choy or i don't know there are just so many options and there's conversations about that flavors also some people are used to some flavors others never tasted something like that before so that alone is so much fun and brings all these cultures together and i love that the differences remain in terms of you know what belongs to your culture and what this doesn't but also at the same time how you're open to explore other ideas other flavors other uh, recipes or or other conversations to add to that you know we have a seed to harvest program so we have hundreds of pounds of the leafy greens we need to harvest all the time so that brings joy and a celebratory moment because it's delicious it's fresh it smells great and it tastes wonderful so all those communities that we were discussing before that exist within our school in all of our schools uh, will be celebrating with that harvest and taking that food home to their families so we do something that is called bringing funds of knowledge to the classroom and that's how we celebrate the diversity of the families even uh, in a larger way through conversation and activities that the students will bring home so we give them cards and questions that go with a head of lettuce or a three heads of basil, et cetera, et cetera, depending on what, what was harvested on the day. And they will ask their family members, their caregivers, ask, tell me, you know, what's hydroponics? Or how do you grow food without soil? Or what's the name of this plant? Or can you smell it? Or how you cooked it before? How our um, ancestors cooked it before? How our friends in our country of home origin cook with this uh, leafy green, if if it's familiar to our family and our culture. And then they will bring those funds of knowledge to the classroom because those parents or caregivers are experts on something in different ways. So it's also a way to not only create these conversations and connect classroom with home, but also provide the opportunity for the students to see their caregivers as experts on something that maybe they didn't have the opportunity before. And they will bring those stories to the classroom and will be shared in the community in a you know a way that the teacher will um, manage and make sure that everyone has the opportunity to participate. So that's one aspect that will celebrate life and the uniqueness of each of us um, in the city and in our communities. In terms of curriculum, I do have examples. So the ideal is really that a com that school community participates in a cross-curricular way. We would love to see more of this. We had uh, experiences with the schools that would have art classes in, in, the, in our classroom space, and they will use the plants to create pigments, and then they would do audubon drawings or observation of the plants, and then color them with the pigments they created with the plants we were growing in the classroom. That's really amazing, you know, but it requires a lot of time and dedication, but it is possible, and we've seen it happening many times. There is a great connection with history because hydroponics, we're talking about 21st century technology, but it's, you know, the oldest technology, the gardens of Babylonia were uh, hydroponic technology, right? And then there's just so much that is used in ancient cultures that is using water to grow green vegetables. And so it existed for so long. So it is beautiful to see how something that is old, all cultural traditions can really become 21st century technology by using and placing it in a different moment in time in a different environment like an urban environment so that's something that is very interesting and it can connect with uh, so many other aspects in terms of access to food different ecosystems and um, a lot of geography etc there's just so many connections that can happen in regards to New York Sound Works has such an amazing curriculum with the diversity of uh, all kinds of activities. So I wonder, what, how do you create them? Well, I think the key is the collaboration. I have a wonderful team of uh, educators as part of New York Sound Works, but all the teachers who work with our classrooms are also authors of the curriculum. So we work for many years with many teachers who would develop lessons for grade specific and uh, targeted to certain units that we wanted to develop. 
So there is many authors that are part of the New York Times curriculum. So it all started with the first family. I do remember when we had our first $10,000 that we got through a grant, we put all that money into curriculum development. Even before we built the greenhouse uh, structure and the, all the technology that would go within that space. So we, we had all the teachers at our first school, PS333, working together, about 15 of them, and we designed a map. So what would be the ideal curriculum? What would be the dream for all of us to teach in the classroom? From that um, framework that we developed together, we kept building and building and building through the years and making it better and more uh, age appropriate and more fun. And also that idea, that exploration that can happen within the classroom. So that's the core of it. And that's why I think it is as creative as you said, and so engaging for the students. The other aspect that was my job to bring was uh, to remind every author that we has to be hands-on and project-based as much as we can if not all the time. Because when you develop curriculum, you start with a lot of energy and then it, it gets difficult to continuously have the hands-on and a project-based approach. So that's that was my job to say, hey, we need to restart here, we need to restart, you know, keep pushing for that experiential um, part of the curriculum that is key to their success. We work also with museum educators to bring some of the concepts of the learning that happens when you're in a visiting um, situation when you're going to a place that you have certain time and you need to catch the most important concepts. So that also helped create certain momentum into the experience of the students when, the, when they are in our classrooms. The teachers are active participants of the program and the, and the evolution of the curriculum. So we test what works in the classroom, but what may work in your classroom may not work in someone else's classroom. So we do give a guideline. The lessons are very clear. You can go A to Z and go by the minute if needed. And that's how many teachers start to get confident. Uh, but then uh, there are always ways, and that's part of the teacher profession, to adapt it and tweak it and make it yours. And we're all for it. We support the teachers on changing and making the lessons and the program themselves so they own it. And that's a wonderful outcome that we really didn't expect it in the beginning. The teachers come and say, listen, it's great for my kids, but it's really awesome for me. I am invigorated. I want to teach this. I'm learning what I didn't know. Not everyone knows about climate change or climate education or climate science, that, as we should. And I feel uh, so renewed and I want to continue teaching and, and teaching this way or adding this content into my teaching and bringing this to my students. So we've created a, a whole uh, group of teachers who continue to join the forces to bring this program, make it their own and bring it to their communities. You mentioned that you learned from and adapted some creative ideas from the science of museums and uh, exhibits. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I think that's my immigrant um, uh, mentality. Uh, uh, when we came to New York, uh, and it continues to be obviously, uh, one of our main activities is to visit in museums. There's just so many opportunities. And that experience, that uh, aha moment that you have when you're in exhibit and you're learning through the process is is very unique and very important. So we embed in the curriculum a lot of um, field trips and the use of the city as a learning opportunity. So from the very beginnings, the impact that those visits had in the students and how was the process of learning is that it became even more important for us to embed that into the curriculum, but also in the classroom setting. So that uh, the fact that the classroom is beautiful because it has the technology, the design is modern and interesting, but also has the leafy greens that are stunning and growing there. It, you enter in an, it's an environment that is very inviting. Uh, and that's what happens when you enter into an exhibition in a museum. And then you are pulled to see things because they call your attention and that drives that internal interest of learning uh, what's going on there or going into more detail into certain aspects, but also to touch and to, and to look and to go around and to see it from different angles. Hi, my name is Tom Wilson, and we're here at the Urban Assembly Institute of Math and Science for Young Women 
This is a all girls public high school in downtown Brooklyn. And I teach environmental science and chemistry and earth science. And I'm also the school sustainability coordinator. I've been working with New York SunWorks for about five years and we have a bunch of their systems in the classroom. This here is an NFT growing a lot of different things. We have two VCS systems growing cucumbers and tomatoes mostly. And if you walk across the classroom where all the students normally sit, um, we have two grow towers that are mostly growing flowers and some peppers and nasturtiums and things like that. And if you come over here, um, we have another grow tower, which is mostly chard, some marigolds, lettuce. And then we have a zip grow right here that's growing similar things. Some flowers mixed with herbs such as cilantro and mint. In environmental science class, we talk a lot about sustainability throughout the year. And these systems really come in handy because water is being recycled, nutrients are being recycled, and throughout the entire year, we're talking about biogeochemical cycles. So having these in the classroom is such a huge benefit. And they've also helped develop leadership skills with the students at UAI because just across the street at the Brooklyn Public Library, they've started a hydroponics program where they're interested in having our students come and lead small workshops with younger students about the benefits of hydroponics and the way that it'll shape the future of New York City and hopefully create a better climate for all of us. I like to bring stories from experiences that I've had in the past into the classroom here. And I lived in Malawi from 2013 to 2015, where I was working with the Peace Corps teaching science. I had a classroom half the size of this. There was 100 students. There was no water. There was no electricity. And there was constant floods, constant drought, constant crop failure. So I like to take those stories, tell my students here about them, and have them think about ways that this technology, hydroponic systems that recycle water and use super low energy lights to generate food in abundance. Um, and I like to have them think about ways that that can help solve problems in countries that suffer from climate change issues such as drought and crop failure. I hope for my students that they leave high school and they get jobs as civil engineers and as thinkers for the rest of the world where these really tough problems like climate change and sea level rise and water scarcity can be addressed by what they've learned here in this class. More and more school districts are implementing climate change education in different grade levels. Do you think that cities and public schools can do it alone without external non-formal education programs? And if they can't, why? Well, I think not-for-profit organizations like ours, New York Sandworks, have started a movement in terms of um, bringing what is missing in the public school education. So we started with the first lab that looked like this one uh, and uh, testing what is necessary, what is new, and how we would bring this type of education and insert climate education into the daily curricula. So that's a start point. With that, we could prove that uh, there was an interest. And currently, we are going to reach 300 schools in the five boroughs of New York alone. And um, that shows that the principals on the schools and the parents and the kids really want climate education and in, within the curriculum. In addition, you can make it in a really fun way with hands-on and project-based. So there are many different ways to address the need and to teach uh, this topic. So I think the ideal case is that the, part, the Department of Education of a city of a country, depending on how that's organized, because it's different in different parts of the world, are really the ones who are pushing towards having this type of curriculum to be part of the formal uh, instruction, the daily instruction during the schools. So it shouldn't be an afterthought, only an after school, only for kids who can afford it, or for only for families or students who are informed enough to be interested. I think it needs to be implemented across the board in every uh, grade level in every school. But do you think that schools really need external nonprofits to come with their curricula, or can the government design next generation science standards in such a way that 
takes care of it all and we don't <laughs> need external organizations to come and help. I think the Department of Education, ministries of education, governments should design and implement it, but doesn't exclude external not-for-profits or external uh, education organizations. Uh, the fact that a, a ministry of a Department of Education designs and, and implements certain curriculum never excludes other partners to be part of that movement and to enrich those opportunities. And that's exactly what happens in New York City, which is very interesting. The schools have a, the mandated, science, for example, science standards and general standards that they need to follow. And it's up to the schools to choose in which way they will implement or teach the standards. Some are more traditional, some are more progressive, more hands-on, uh, um, community-oriented, place-based oriented. There are so many aspects that really fit different communities that is, I think is wonderful that the schools have the ability to best uh, serve their own communities while meeting the standards that are required. So I don't think that the fact that a ministry or a department of education or a government in general designs and mandates certain standard is exclusive of not-for-profit or other education uh, organizations to be part of bringing quality education to every student. I think um, in general, organizations like New York Sandworks bring innovation into the area. It could be other organizations that bring other ideas or, or ways of learning. And I think that's enriching. It's a way to enrich the way students learn, but also it's a way to uh, continuously improve and innovate and bring new trends and, and, and new aspects of our evolving societies into what is needed within those communities. So if it wouldn't be for organizations that are um, for example, New York Samuels, who are thinking of what's the new, what are the new systems, in, what is the new technology for urban farming? What are the new systems for a hydroponic technology, which is what we specialize on? Or, or what are the new trends in terms of fish farming and how you can uh, do that efficiently? We wouldn't be able to bring this into the classroom as we do it today. And others may be doing it with uh, renewable energy. Maybe it's focused on solar. Maybe others are focusing on other aspects. The fact that there are organizations that are interested in bringing this variety of opportunities into schools only enriches the opportunities for the students and brings innovation into the classroom. I was just thinking that uh, artificial curricula is like a Titanic. It's, it can go to a good direction, but to steer it like left or right, it mm -hmm. takes like a long time, whereas right. there will be a smaller players that will say, oh, we can bring those innovations. Yes, I think in general that's the role of a not-for-profit organization to bring innovation and to uh, bring what is missing uh, in school communities. And uh, in that way, organizations like New York Sunworks are able to not only bring innovation, but bring what is needed in a science curriculum. Um, we think that climate education and climate science should be part of the daily instruction, should be part of the year-long instruction in every school, in every grade, and therefore we tested that, and that's how uh, we could prove that they're not, it's not only important and necessary, but it's also that schools want it. And by schools, I mean teachers, parents, students, you know, they all are welcoming this new uh, content that is so important in the moment we're living. Hi, I'm Dave Hazan. I'm the Director of Control Environment Agriculture here in New York Sunworks. We are in this beautiful greenhouse on top of Manhattan School for Children. Uh, what I was doing here today was uh, talking to the students about honeybees and keeping them and how they produce honey. And the reason why I was doing that today, I keep bees for myself. And uh, they were learning about pollinators in their class, which is very important because they help produce the food that we eat. As the Director of Control Environment Agriculture here in New York Sunworks, I help to maintain and, and run the existing greenhouse classrooms that we have. Our team works closely with the teachers, showing them how to use the different systems and helping them to maintain and to grow the plants. So our greenhouse classrooms help students make that connection with where their food comes from and also how it's grown and it helps with sustainability because we're able to grow more food in a more local environment. 
so we have to travel less or our food has to travel less to get to our plates. We want to make sure the students are actually learning what we are teaching in the classroom. So we want to make sure the lessons are clear, efficient, and the students are going through a learning process. So there is a, a growth curve. While that's happening, we want to make sure the students uh, understand scientific methods, understand uh, um, concepts that should be basic for us as, as citizens of the world, uh, such as uh, what is their carbon cycle, for example. And once we understand those concepts, then other data becomes more clear and more important. And therefore, we become more informed in terms of our decisions. If we can understand a text that we can read and it's providing scientific information, then we can process and make informed individual decisions. In addition, of course, I, in terms of uh, the program, I would love to see how are we impacting students in providing, for example, a safe space for learning. Uh, how are we in, impacting students in terms of girls and sci in science and STEM? Uh, I would love to see the impact of our program in, in the long term, how students are choosing their careers in college. Maybe we're inspiring some students to go into the sciences, but also if uh, we are really changing the attitudes and behaviors that the students have after learning these concepts within the classroom. Uh, in addition, uh, we, I would love to see how much are we empowering students as citizens of the world? How much are they understanding their value within the classroom, the value within their school communities, the larger community, their country, their value as uh, their citizenship? You know, eventually they're gonna become the people who are going to be electing the next uh, representatives, who are going to be making the larger decisions in terms of education, what's in the curriculum, what communities should get, what type of electricity we should have. That's part of a world that requires informed citizens to make the right decisions. Do you also think that uh, your program helps students in some ways to find a little bit more meaning in their studies. Yeah, we have uh, anecdotal data from teachers who said uh, students in high school who they wouldn't attend on some days, they would never miss the day they have to come to work in their hydroponic classroom. And uh, we also have uh, other teachers who tell us stories like how, for example, a like kindergarten class was a standing ovation when they were told they were going to harvest the tomatoes that day. So it have stories from so many different grades and from many different communities that tell you how passionate are students uh, when they are growing food and learning the science elements of each step from seed to harvest and also how delicious and fresh is the food they harvest and they eat everything they grow in the classroom. What is the impact of your program on, on the teacher and school level? Yeah, that's a, a, a wonderful element that we see in the schools. The classroom brings the community together at many levels. So suddenly you see the security guard showing and saying, hey, uh, is there any cilantro this week for harvest or there is uh, basil or lettuce or anything, you know, that is growing in the classroom. You see uh, parents interested of what's going on in the classroom. You see definitely the community of teachers coming together and say what's going on there there is so much excitement and the students are all talking about the changes that are happening in this lab that is you know coming alive thanks to the work of the students that they do that all the time again you know the magic of seeing the plants growing from seed to harvest but in addition the elements of the control environmental agriculture that makes it really magical the fact that we have the right amount of nutrients, the right amount of temperature, the right amount of light. Those are the elements of a controlled environment agriculture uh, process allows for this food to grow at its max potential. And therefore, the students, when they come on a weekly basis or on a bi-weekly basis, they see the plants growing at such a fast pace that it's really another element of engagement and of magic that happens in every classroom. What does this space look like in summer? Well, it, honestly, in most cases, the, the technology allows us to close the labs for the summer. Some buildings are just closed and there's no access for students or families. 
and therefore we can just close the labs and restart in September. But in other buildings, they have summer school and summer programs. Therefore, we continue with the programming in some cases with students, in other cases with other community-based organizations that will be just farming and using the food harvested in their communities. So we've worked in the past and we will be working this summer with uh, retirement homes. We work with the summer youth employment program of the mayor's office. We work with housing organizations that come and take the food and bring them to their communities. So there's a variety of other organizations that become partners during the summer only and they benefit from having you know, the structure in place and, and a farm running over the summer. We are part of that large ecosystem of uh, organizations that are trying to bring change at, in the city and there's so many different levels. We decided to focus in entering uh, the schools through the science curriculum and making sure that the students are exposed to sustainability science and climate education during science instruction during the school time. What's about uh, conference participation? When we go to conferences and we discuss the program to get feedback and to challenge our own ideas and to see how we can improve certain aspects, etc. And we mentioned that we're working with uh, 250, soon to be 300 schools, 120,000 students. We're the largest sample of uh, cases or programs in those conferences. We didn't realize really how large we are <laughs> and how large is our impact uh, as a not-for-profit organization until we went to international conferences and we realized, not that we didn't know, but we realized at the moment, oh, we're larger than some cities are represented here and trying to bring change. That's a fun, uh, fun fact. <laughs> But really, uh, what matters is that the way we bring innovation is not only through the teachers and the work we do, but we're also constantly seeing and getting informed of what is the new research and new ways of uh, mitigating climate change. So we need to stay um, move from uh, our inconvenient truth to speed and scale that is has been published recently, and then that's you know we really use the information and the research that is outside to in to bring into the program program that is implemented in the school and that's the power of non-profits developing curricula that you can quickly learn and quickly implement changes in the curricula exactly uh, i think that's a very good uh, very good point i think that's the value of the non-profit partnership within a larger education system that you are agile and fast that you can go with the new research and the new information that is out and implemented at a small scale and see and, and see change very quickly. For example, there is an enormous conversation and awe in terms of artificial intelligence and, and what does it mean and, and how do we implement no, more technology and more uh, knowledge into the program. So we are very hands-on project-based but we do use technology for farming, and that technology evolves. So while we are keeping our students sitting by hand and taking the pH uh, levels on a daily basis with the pH strips and writing down the numbers, which could be done by a computer, we are seeing in parallel um, what are the new developments in urban ag and in control environment agriculture in particular. So these students can be prepared to get the green jobs of the future, which are not of the future anymore. They are here right now. So we are always seeing uh, and using the latest research and latest opportunities, not only in the agriculture field, but also education and in general, uh, sustainability and climate education. Hi, my name is Ariel. I work for New York Soundworks. And my role is area manager, which means that I help make sure that the GST team, the maintenance team that comes into schools such as this one, they have everything that they need and that schools are being supported. So this system here is our aquaponic system. This is a really good example of how uh, we bring sustainability into classrooms. We have tilapia in this system, which produce waste, which feeds the bacteria, which feeds the plants. The system cycles through three different components. 
in this main tank, which contains the tilapia and our raft for most of our plants, uh, the water is pulled into the clarifying tank, which removes the solid waste and filters it into our biofilter, which holds most of our bacteria. And then that cycles back into the tank and then the cycle is constantly repeating. These are really simple, accessible tools that you can use in your classroom to teach students about sustainability and healthy ecosystems. You're from Bolivia. What did it look like to grow up in Bolivia? Well, it's a, uh, like all, everyone loves their own country and everyone, we all think that we're country of origin must be the most wonderful place in the planet and obviously each of those uh, places also have its own challenges. For me it was uh, really the diversity of the people and the diversity of ecosystems that we have that makes it very important and what I learned most from my country and I think it's what I've used the most in my current life in New York City. So the ability to understand people from different backgrounds, different cultures, different languages, because we have an enormous diversity of languages and um, as well as um, cultural backgrounds, you know, uh, groups, uh, cultural groups from music to, to food, to dance, to areas of the country, geographies, different geographies within the country. So that's, uh, I think, the most valuable part of my upbringing in Bolivia. Can you share with us any significant life events back in Bolivia <laughs> that influenced who you are now? I was lucky to have a very supportive family and, and go to a school who had a really strong education. But I was aware that it was the minority of us who had that access to that level of education. So I was always aware of what are other students my age or younger or older doing and, and how they are learning. I grew up in La Paz, which is a dense urban environment. Um, according to me, it's like New York City because it's, it, it has a lot of activity and that's how I feel so much at home here. And that allowed me to have a, an idea of uh, how to navigate a very dense urban environment, which has very different socioeconomic realities and a, as well, very different access to education. So the private sector, it's not as an inaccessible in terms of price like here in the United States, but it is much more expensive than the public education system and the similar problems you know you have uh, maybe not the same quality of teachers you don't, you have larger classrooms in the public school system and um, i think the most important aspect there it was seen the lack of investment in the education system and then that trickles down into not maybe great salaries for teachers and therefore the teacher profession not necessarily being something that people would aspire to for different reasons. I think that's, that was something that was present there, that I was always aware of the differences. Probably my parents, we are uh, from another town that is Sucre, so we were people that we moved to, to a different city, so, so that you know already brings, puts you in a different um, position. Like my, I grew up there, I was very young, but my parents moved moved and they were we always had those two cities we belonged to so we would go to Sucre to see my grandparents and we always drove by car so I could see all the small towns that we were going through. Uh, my dad was a car racer so we always loved driving and he would take us all over every trip was always by car so we could see a lot of the country and it was beautiful. My mom uh, was a teacher and um, a, a school teacher. She also uh, taught reading to adults, and especially adults who have migrated from the country and they were working in houses, you know, um, as cleaning or supporting with cooking, etc. So she would have, I would always have seen her teaching these adults who couldn't read or write, and she would spend at least three afternoons every week dedicated to that. And then we would go to other places where she would organize a group of adults who would learn to read and write, usually women. So maybe all those elements were part of our regular life. I didn't realize that maybe it were a diff little different, but they provide me with a, a different eye to see the needs and the differences in terms of access to education, to quality education, and um, also to books, learning materials, and later in life technology.
And uh, what is your education? Did you go to college back there? Yes, I was finished high school, K through 12 school. I went to college in Argentina, actually in Buenos Aires. So I studied uh, photography first, and uh, then I went back to my country and I went to college to study history. And then I um, was lucky to come to the US to do a master's in education later on in uh, Cambridge uh, College in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Manuela, what is your relationship with books? So there were books uh, as part of my life. My parents were good readers. Uh, my dad used to read the entire newspaper. So the newspaper was always part of, of our daily routine or chatting. And, um, and my mom was a very avid reader, always reading either out loud to us with my brothers and sisters or, or she was reading on her own. And later when we had um, high school assignments uh, for Latin American literature, we had several books per week and she would read them aloud to all my friends. So we, would, we were always there, uh, you know, part of, part of the reading club with my mom. Today I do love reading. I love um, non-fiction reading and I love books related to brain development or different uh, education, uh, education related topics. Parenting books were also a part of my passion and I think they are very useful in terms of teaching and understanding others when you work with uh, school age students. Can you share some specific titles of the books you've read recently? So one would be Brainstorm, it's about teenager brain development. Uh, I love that one. Another one is um, How to Talk to Strangers and uh, from Gladwell. And the one that I read recently and is a must for everyone, it's uh, Nudge from Thaler and Sunstein. And it, that's about behavioral economics. Do you think that the nudge is somehow related to um, this idea that you sometimes mention giving choice to students in classrooms? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great connection because when the students come to the classroom and this, it's, they see this you know, setting that we have and the hydroponics technology, etc., they are so willing to jump into it and have the experience. But how do you set the information and how you organize the information has an impact into the immediate reaction. I mean, it's not a rule and it that always apply, but in usually it does an impact and, and it, it offers the student choices, but not too many choices. So it's just like, you know, too much information, but choices so they can really make the uh, decisions, they be on the decision, on the answer, um, and then they are guided through the choices too. So it definitely connects to the nudge concept. You said you read also a lot about pedagogy. How did it influence you as a parent for your own kids? Actually, the best books I've read that, have, that are useful today in the classroom at work when I relate to other you know, co-workers or anywhere, it's a book that is called How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and How to Listen So Kids Will Talk. It's a parenting book with a, with a workbook. And it's really amazing how it, you learn to listen, you learn to acknowledge the other person's opinion, uh, the other person's feelings, and then it's, you open a channel of communication that is uh, just so rewarding on both ends. Well, since you are from Bolivia and you've read a lot of uh, Latin American literature, I cannot uh, avoid asking you what are your recommendations for fiction? <laughs> It may sound like, of course, the obvious answer, but I'm really uh, a lover of uh, magic uh, realism. And I believe that Gar Garcia Marquez, Gabriel Garcia Marquez is uh, my number one author. And it is definitely my favorite author. I read, I think, all his books and uh, you can read them again and again. And every time you read, you have a new interpretation of a moment. It is uh, just a joy. Crónica de una muerte anunciada. I think it's a lot of fun and uh, I'm sure it exists in English. And uh, you've also mentioned in other conversation, you had an experience of working with NGOs or with human rights back in Bolivia before you came to the US. Can you tell uh, a little bit more about it? Yes, so uh, I ran a uh, not-for-profit in Bolivia. It was called Fundación Carmen and we work with women artisans that would um, have a micro loan and they would work in groups um, producing um, something that they were in some ways 
skilled already. So for example, it, it, there's a lot of um, uh, hand woven or arty crafts that, that are part of our culture in Bolivia and therefore many people grow, grow up uh, learning those skills. So we had uh, several groups uh, of women, that, for example, they were focusing on different aspects. One was in El Alto that were doing rugs because they were very good at weaving with um, looms already. And then um, th we would uh, provide them with the training, additional training, so the quality would reach at an important level to, be, um, to have products that could be easy to sell in the market. And uh, we would also provide quality materials so therefore uh, they wouldn't be um, trying to save on the materials and then having a product that is not really great for the market so we would provide really good quality of uh, materials and uh, the training and then uh, we would work together in the design so there were some designs that were traditional and others that were like more neutral so they would produce certain amount of products uh, that they will be sold in a store that we have, like a cooperative store, where they all have the, the production. So the idea is that we they needed to provide their time, and we would provide everything else. And the minute that they would have the product ready, we would pay them 50% in cash, so they have certain income for the time they had invested, and again, would start with new materials for the next round of production. So it would be like a constant production um, and, and selling within the store. And we created, you know, we work with almost 3,000 women in different groups in different areas of the country. Uh, it was really magical and wonderful. Are there any universal skills that you may have learned during that work that you are still using? Uh, absolutely, because to get funding for that project, we need to have to go to foundations or to international groups that wanted to invest in developing this kind of um, programs. That aspect was very important in the learning process because um, I learned from the, from the receiver's end that when people come from the outside with an idea of what they want to invest or what they want to do in your space and with the good intentions of improving people's lives, they don't always know what the local people want or they are, or they are, not, always, they are not always in agreement. So many times it happens that you people come, would go to a place and say, okay, this is what we want to do and this is how I want it to happen. And, and may not be the best idea. And also maybe that the locals don't want to do that or they don't need that. Uh, so it, that communication is fundamental. It happens a lot in very large, from governmental support to international NGOs, etc., who go into developing world to bring these opportunities. So that was an enormous learning curve because I was on the receiving side and I was listening to people saying, oh, you need to do this, this and that. And we we're like, we don't want to do that. We don't need this. We want to go this other route with, our, with the people we were working with. So when I moved to this country and I started this project in New York, that was the base of the partnership with the schools. So we started with this premise. It was, OK, what is needed? You know, we will work with our first pilot school and uh, we work with the teachers developing the curriculum, understanding what was needed for the community, what would fit the New York City's public school system, and all that design. So that was first. And then we would um, go to the communities and say, okay, this is what we have, but you can adjust it to your needs. So what do you need? There's always that dialogue. We have this basic technology and the farming and the curriculum, which goes into the standards that are mandated by the city. But are, do you have District 75 students? Do you have specialized high school students? You have a very uh, um, technology-driven middle school. Do you have very large classes? I mean, there's so many realities that the project needs to adapt so that people can own it on, on one hand. On the other hand, I also learned in my country that the people who is the beneficiary needs to invest can be 100% free because then it doesn't have necessarily long-term value, usually. So in our partnerships, we ask the schools to provide two things, a classroom, a space, and in New York City, that's a commodity. It's, there, it's a commitment. We know there's no space. Willing to provide a space to invest in this program is very important, but they, they can because they have a building. It's a matter of decision. If they really want to do it, they can. 
And number two is they need to provide a teacher and that's within the roster. So that also is costly for the schools. It's not, uh, it is expensive, but it is within their abilities because they have a budget, they have teachers hire, and it could be a part-time position for a teacher. It could be a the science teacher who takes over. There's so many different ways that can fit in, but that's an investment that the schools will request the schools to make. And then it, we, we, we continue building from there. What lessons or ideas would you give to other executive directors of educational organizations that are developing all kinds of sustainability or environment or climate related uh, curriculum? Uh, two things, I think. One is um, working with your team and really um, listening because uh, Every person will, of course, have a different approach, a different idea. So listening to your team. Before that, I would add, having a very diverse team is, is great. And that's something that we thrive at New York Sunworks. So different backgrounds, different um, um, upbringing, different areas of the country, of the globe that they, they all uh, bring into the organization. So listening to your team and creating that collaboration as, as you develop the curriculum at work, developing this program is, I think, key in one aspect within your organization. And as developing the program itself or curriculum to provide to, to schools or communities, I think number one is um, make it relevant to the reality of those communities. What are those communities really in need? What connects to, to what they um, don't have what they need uh, in, in different areas. But that connection is really important. For us, it's access to fresh food, but you know, we're you are um, completing a comprehensive science curriculum while we're growing food. So we're doing two things at once. But I think those connections to the needs of the community are fundamental. What will be your legacy for the city and for schools? I feel like there's still so much we need to do. But I guess the most important legacy, hopefully, it is the um, insertion of a different way of learning. Uh, a, a way that allows so many aspects that makes us humans just better people individually, but also as a community. And I think farming, it is an amazing connector. It's uh, not only providing the opportunities for learning, but also providing the opportunities to be, to be our best selves as we work together in the community. The opportunity to work in collaboration brings this program to a different level because we collaborate with everyone, regardless of their language or their cultural background the um, educational interests, abilities. It really brings the entire community together and pushes everyone to be their best individually, but also as, as a cohesive group. If many years ago you didn't start to advance the hydroponics and climate and sustainability education, what would be, what <laughs> else would you do now? I don't know, that's a very hard question. <laughs> I am sure I would be involved in the not-for-profit world. I would be working on education, in the education field for sure. And um, I would have been focusing on gender education and development for sure. Those were aspects of uh, my life always, regardless of the field that I was involved with. I've done uh, photography for many years and women were the subject of my images. I've done uh, um, more political involvement work and I always work with uh, for women equality and women's rights and opportunities. And then um, I channeled my energy into women's education. What does it mean to create safe space for girls and women in science, in, in STEM and sustainability field? and how does New York Sun Works advances it? Mm -hmm. it? It is very important as a parent, as an educator, to really provide opportunities for the ones who otherwise don't have them. So even though women education and development 
in my country, Bolivia, when I was living there, was a priority for me. When I moved to the U.S. and to New York, uh, it remained an important topic, but it really was hand in hand with other realities, such as the reality of an immigrant. Women in STEM and girls in STEM remains a focus of our program as we provide safe spaces for learning and girls are more inclined to science when they have different ways to experiment it and different entry points to do science as the ones we provide in our labs. Minority groups also have and see those opportunities. So interestingly, what I would have thought it was an element for say women empowerment in science, uh, it also became an important tool for uh, minorities empowerment entering into science, regardless of the gender. So I, myself, as a Latin American woman, a Spanish, native Spanish speaker, I see students uh, with my same profile, and now in the school, taking advantage of the opportunities we provide because we're creating those safe spaces for learning exploration, experimentation, uh, working as a community. And what specifically creates a safe space for individuals? I think the key is that um, in a hydroponic classroom, we provide many entry points for learning. But also there are not necessarily right or wrong answers. There are many ways to do things. And there are many roles in the process. So when you're doing seed to harvest farming with the technology, you're not only, let's say, seeding the trays and making sure those seeds uh, germinate and sprout. But also you can go into deeper science, let's say, analyze photosynthesis or analyze space management, or, you know, there are so many elements that are part of this process that a student can engage with. So not having just one track and one way to do things open the opportunities for all types of learners to feel empowered and to own the learning process. So you may be focusing on chemical changes in certain specific process. I may be focusing on just germination, but you cannot work without my, my part because you need my plants. So we really team up and work together and therefore the value of my work is very important within the big picture. So it really allows all students to enter, as I said, at, at different levels and own their work and be so proud of their work because it is necessary. So I think that's what the magic, that's really how we create these safe spaces because the learning can be individualized based on the roles that happen in the classroom and based on the interests of the students. In addition to the learning that happens in the classroom, the scientific learning, there is so much magic around the activities the students have every day. Can you imagine harvesting a tomato full of flavor and uh, you know tasting it? It's something that you want to have it again. Therefore, you want to share that with your family, with your community, and then you may start advocating to have access to fresh, delicious food in your neighborhood. In a similar way, they will develop a flavor for sustainability, an understanding of what they can demand and what they should have in their communities and the neighborhoods. We were always aware that it was our responsibility as adults and as educators, as parents too, to prepare the next generation of environmental innovators and really empower them to create solutions for the climate challenges that we're living in our time. And ultimately, my hope is to see more and more students looking for ways to contribute into a carbon neutral city and a more sustainable future.